Today is World Communion Sunday, and here at First Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Selma, California, we think that's kind of a big deal. So today we're doing things a little differently than usual. We had a processional with the bread and cup and Bible carried in to remind ourselves of the importance of word and table. We're singing songs from all around the world, even in languages we don't know, to show our relationship with the church wherever it exists. We have declared today, Bring a Friend Sunday, and invited friends and relatives, neighbors, and co-workers to join us for worship. Today we are celebrating God's love for humanity. What are human beings that you think of them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? And the psalmist has a point. I mean, really? What are we to the creator of everything? When we look at the sky, at the planets and the stars, at the snow-covered mountains, at the immensity of the seas, at the perfection of the tiny atom, when we look at all of the strange and wonderful creatures that God has created, we have to wonder, why should we even matter? We matter because God made us in God's image. Every one of us, every single human is a reflection of God, a child of God. In the eyes of God, no one, no person is more beloved or important than any other. We may have trouble with the concept because of the way the world sees things, but in God's eyes, we are all beloved. In the human realm, it's easy to see that some believe themselves to be more important than others. It is easy to see that some are held to be of greater or lesser worth than others. But that's the human world, not God's world. In God's world, there are no races or classes or genders, no Gentile or Jew, no slave or free, no woman or man, but only human beings, frail and fallible, but oh, so dearly loved. God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to teach us how to be reconciled with God and with one another, how to return God's love for us and how to share that love with all of our brothers and sisters. And because the human world fears and hates that which it does not understand, Jesus died at the hands of men who feared the loss of their own power. Because Jesus was human like us, his suffering and his death on the cross, his sacrifice, became the foundation upon which his church was built. But before he died, he instituted a practice, a sacrament, if you will, sharing a meal with his beloved disciples, and saying, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. In the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, we take those instructions from Jesus very seriously, and we share this meal every time we come together for worship. And we share it with everybody who is present, just as Jesus did on that night. Even with the one who would betray him, who might have been considered unworthy. Because, you see, we don't believe that anybody is not worthy of God's love. Our denomination, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, was founded upon around the belief that the Lord's table should be open to all who come to share this meal of love. In about 1808, Thomas Campbell, a Presbyterian minister, was carrying the good news into small communities on the western frontier of the United States, which at that time was western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Kentucky. There were no established churches in those areas. He came into those settlements to preach and to marry folks and perform baptisms for the kids that those folks had before they got married because there were no churches. Often it had been years since the last time they saw a preacher. But one thing he could not do was offer communion to those who were not Presbyterian, in good standing, and could prove their 
belief in and understanding of the Apostles' Creed. If you were in that frontier community and hadn't seen a minister in years, but you were a Baptist or a Methodist or some order, other sort of Christian, you were not allowed to come to the table. That upset him. And so, even though it was against the rules, he began to serve everyone who came. When the Presbytery who had sent him into the frontier heard this, of course, they kicked him out. <laughs> they suspended his credentials. Which didn't stop him. He just started a church where the table was open and no creed was required as a test of faith, where everyone could share this meal. Meanwhile, back in Scotland, his son Alexander had completed seminary and with his mother and siblings was preparing to join his father in the United States when Communion Sunday came around. Alexander, a seminary graduate, was easily able to prove his belief in and understanding of the creed, and he was given a token which he would then present to the elders on Communion Sunday to prove that he was allowed to partake in the meal. But there was a man there at that church who had not been able to prove himself to the elders, to their satisfaction. He was not able to prove that he could come to the table, that he was worthy. Alexander had a problem with that. So he gave that man his token and he skipped communion that year. Arriving in the U.S., he discovered that he and his father had had similar conclusions about the table and creeds, and together they founded a movement, a church, in which no one is required to prove they believe the right stuff in order to come to the table. No creed but Christ, they said, and we still hold to that. Today we proclaim that we are the disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world, as part of the one body of Christ, we welcome all to the Lord's table, as God has welcomed us. All are welcome, and all means all. Another difference between disciples and many other traditions is that no ordained minister is required to preside at this table. Ordained ministers in the early days of the church, as you would understand, were usually itinerant. And they might not be at any given church every single Sunday. But we do share communion every single Sunday, whether or not an ordained person is present. So the elders of congregations regularly presided at the table. This practice varies from congregation to congregation today. In some, the elders preside, in others, the minister does. Each congregation does it in the way that they prefer. It is therefore well known that you might be a disciple if whenever you visit a new disciple's congregation, you learn a new way to do communion. In this congregation, most weeks, the elders preside at the table and the deacons serve. This week is going to be a little different. And I need to tell you this because... On my very first World Communion Sunday serving the church, we put various sorts of breads on the table, but I didn't say anything about it because I figured everyone would get the symbolism of being World Communion Sunday and all. Uh, however, after worship, I heard someone complain that somebody must have forgotten to buy the bread this week because there were tortillas and some kind of weird rolls on the table instead. So... Today, we have three stations for communion, where bread and cup will be available, each representing a different part of the world. We have China and Africa and Latin America. I will do the words of institution and serve from this table, and the elders, one each, will be at those tables. The deacons, there's deacons here, right? Somebody? Anybody? Yes, there are deacons. The deacons will direct you as to where to go so nobody runs into each other. Um, you know, don't want to be tripping over folks while we're taking communion. 
So they will help direct you to Africa or China or Latin America. You will take a piece of bread that is offered and you will dip it in the cup and eat and then go back to your seat. If you cannot come forward, don't worry. Someone will bring it to you. No one will be left out of the Lord's Supper because everyone deserves to participate in this remembrance of God's love for us. Just as we welcome everyone to the table every Sunday, so too do we welcome everyone to worship whom God has made in God's image, which is everybody. In some congregations and traditions, there are rules about who can participate in various aspects of the life of the church, but that is not the case here. No matter who you are, you are welcome here. You are welcome to take any, any, form of participation that you wish. You are worthy. You are loved. There are those who say that coming to this table every single week is too often, that it becomes routine and loses importance. But really, how often is too often to experience God's love? The table is a way that every single time we come together, we remember that we are loved. The table is the way that we remember humanity so important to God that he sent his son to show us the way to him. This table is a symbol of God's I love you, just as wedding and engagement and promise rings are symbols of human love for one another. The psalmist asks, who are we? that you should care. And God says, you are my children, my beloved, whom I care so much about that I sent you my son. And here at this table, we remember that every week. Every week we experience God's love through the bread of life and the cup of salvation. My brothers and sisters, please stand and join me in singing the words that the psalmist gave us. How majestic is your name.